Hello everyone and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. This is Saturday the 22nd of February and our special guest today is Felix Giacomino and his topic is the many facets of successful technology integration. My name is Lori Moffitt. I'm one of the co-hosts for the show. Uh, also with Peggy George and Tammy Moore who we thank for doing the closed captioning for today and all our shows. This slide shows you our live binder for today. The link is at the bottom, but it, it isn't live. Peggy will put the link into chat. Notice the links inside the live binder are, are all along the left edge rather than the top edge of the live binder. All the recordings get posted at the Archives and Resources page located here at live.classroom2.0.com slash archive dash and resources.html. There is a link that Peggy also will put in the chat for the Archives and Resources page. So they're all in that area of the Classroom 2.0 Live website. This is a slide where I'm going to ask you to participate in. Uh, please pick one of those pointers. And in order to activate the pointer, you've got to push down on the mouse button. Otherwise, only you see where the pointer is. And uh, I'm logging in from central Pennsylvania. Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. Peggy logs in from Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm guessing Felix is in Florida from the uh, web tour that we've d he did. We do have an international audience today. You can also type in the chat where you're logging in from. So here's our first polling question. And that is, what is your role in education? And I'm going to switch the choices so that we can do this. There we go. A, are you a teacher? B, administrator? C, technology integration specialist or tech director? D, library media specialist or E? And if you are choice E, please type in the chat. And again, the place to vote is right below your name under participants, not here on the slide because it won't work on the slide. And once we have results, I will post these to the whiteboard. And from those that voted most, almost half are teachers logging in. Our next question, do you currently have a one-to-one -one program in your school or classroom? And give me a chance to switch the polling type. So this is a yes or no. And again, I'll wait for you to cast your vote for this question. And I will post those to the whiteboard now. And it looks like 21% are one-to-one, 36% -one, are not. Our third question, do you think, what do you think of the PD you are currently receiving in your school or district? Would you like to see the quality of your PD improved? Second part of that question, you can answer yes or no. First part, you'd have to type in the chat, I would think. Let me clear the responses from before. And please vote on polling question number three. I see. OK, thanks, Peggy, for clarifying that a little bit. OK, 
just answer yes or no for the second part of the question, please. And I will post that response. And again, from those that voted, 30% of the room said yes. Again, I'd like, you to, I'd like to welcome you all to today's show, which is the many facets of successful technology integration. And Wes Fryer will now introduce Felix. Let's, let's try this again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Wes Fryer, and I'm thrilled to have a chance to introduce Felix, who I have been able to get together with the last couple years because of the Mobile Learning Conference hosted in Arizona. And the things I would share about Felix is that he is on the cutting edge of technology. with not only mobile learning, but one-to-one -one learning. But he's also very attuned and savvy to the ways to move teachers and help teachers move forward with their use of technology. And so I think his topic about technology integration and the facets of it and the ways in which we can help everyone move forward from wherever we happen to be with our digital literacy is an awesome one. And uh, I just can't wait to learn from him. And also looking forward to Miami Device, which will be coming up in November. That's a big conference that he's putting together. So thanks so much for your Thank you, Wes Fryer. This is Siri, his assistant. I will be introducing Felix directly. Well, with no further ado, ladies and gentlemen of Classroom 2.0 Live, here is Felix Giacomino. Uh, thanks, Siri. Uh, thanks, Wes. Uh, it's great to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's thrilling to see how many uh, countries we have involved uh, from all over the world. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, talk on this topic, a topic that I'm very uh, passionate about, and that is um, mostly going to be uh, done around professional development. Uh, but before I get started with that, I want to just, for the newbies uh, in the uh, audience and for anybody else who just might like to hear what my uh, take on technology integration is, is to answer the simple question of what does technology integration mean? So in education, technology integration is simply including a technological tool to the teaching and learning process. It's just bringing something that's technological into the party. So some examples would be using a computer to look up information on the internet, where before we, we just went to the library and used encyclopedias, journals, etc. Uh, another example would be using an iPad to record a student role playing a historical event and sharing it online, where before we might have done the acting out, but the audience was limited to the classroom and the teacher. We didn't have the ability to share out as wide as we could before. So integration can happen with much little or even no effect on the learning process, depending on how well teachers are trained and how uh, where along the lines in the SAMR model, which I'll refer to later, in, or in just a bit rather, its usage falls. So uh, now that I've mentioned the SAMR model, I'll go ahead and go uh, to that model. So um, I would actually like to uh, know just if you can just add in the chat room, yes or no, have you heard of the SAMR model? I would just like to see some yeses and nos. If you've heard of the SAMR model, so uh, I know how much to speak on that. OK, we've got everything from a little to yes and no. So it, starting down at the bottom, substitution. Substitution just means you're using a technological tool to do what could be done without it. So if you open up a, a word processor, and just type something out and send it to a printer and hand it in. That would be substitution. Uh, there's not much advantage to using technology only at the substitution level. Um, and as a matter of fact, if all you do is ever stay on the substitution level, my uh, 
recommendation is to save your money and not and and spend it in other ways because uh, you're not truly using the ex these expensive tools to the best of their ability. Uh, going up to augmentation, augmentation. Now there's something that uh, is, is advantageous, such as let's say you are typing that said paper on a word processor, but now you're leveraging the fact that you can spell check, the fact that you can turn it in electronically rather than uh, printing, it up, printing it out so you can maybe email it uh, and, and such. So you're used, starting to use the benefits of the technological tool. Up to modification, this is where the transformation begins to happen and now you're starting to do things the way they could not be done before. Uh, so now uh, having students collaborate on one document using Google Docs, for example, would be uh, a way that it's transformed. Now we can uh, all work together. In preparation for today, uh, Peggy and, and Wes and I, we all shared in that Google Doc and we were all doing it at the same time. That's different. Going up to redefinition, now we're really talking about things that just couldn't be possible before. Uh, before we could collaborate, but now we're doing it electronically. Uh, so that's the modification in there. But going to re up to redefinition is when you now are publishing to the world and you're having the world have the input into what you've done. Uh, going back and forth, reposting, and, and that's just a real fun part. And that is where we have seen, at least at our school, and, and many of the schools I've visited where the, the real fun begins and the students get so engaged when they see that they have such a broad audience and they're sharing ideas around the world. So here is a tale of two schools. Uh, as I thought this up, I kind of thought uh, uh, those of you who um, are a little older than 20, now you remember Goofus and Gallant. Remember Goofus and Gallant? Well, that was the idea behind this. Um, here's Goofus and Gallant. So you, it's up to you to know which one it is. And uh, here's the tale of two schools. Both schools, and let's all understand this, both schools have the identical setup. I know that looks very technical, but that's not important. All I'm letting you know is that their infrastructure is the same, their computers are the same, they have the same amount of laptops, the same, same amount of teachers, they have everything identical. The teachers, the amount of teachers, the, the ratios, all identical. School A adopted a one-to-one -one because they thought it would make them, notice the quotation marks, 21st century. That's what they thought. They said, well, iPads seem to be the thing to do, or Chromebooks, be it what it, what it may. So we're going to do that because it seems to be the trend in education. And we'll be 21st century. That was school A's thought. School B truly understood what 21st century was all about. They also did some research and they knew that having one-to-one -one devices might help them with their one-to-one, -one, with their, sorry, 21st century learning initiative. They also knew that it's not synonymous. A lot of people, and I, trust me when I say that, you say uh, 21st century uh, learning to parents, they will most definitely think of computers first. 21st century, oh, that means that they're going to be using a lot of devices, electronics, computers, etc. And uh, it, it really is uh, the responsibility of the school to educate the parents and let them know a little bit more about what 21st century is. So school A, who did they talk to? They said, well, you're the computer guy running our network, what do you think we should uh, go with? Should we go with iPads or Chromebooks? And, um, or should we stick to laptops and such and such? And maybe the IT guy has his preference because of what might be easier for him or her to manage. School B knew to start where the learning happens. Who's le leading the learning? And that's the teachers. They know to ask the teachers uh, the right questions about curriculum, what needs need to be met, and what they want students to be able to do. Swabat, students will be able to. That doesn't change. Good teaching has never changed. It's always been about what you want to get the students to be able to do and using whatever resources you have to get that done. School A spent lots of time looking for all the right gadgets, all the right apps. How can we look, what websites are we going to use? And they put that 
first. They put that cart before the horse there. Whereas School B provided professional development for teachers. Um, they made sure that the teachers understood how the learning was going to change at their school, what they were going to do to dig deeper, what they were going to do to get the students excited and enthusiastic about their learning and make the learning their own, giving them that voice and choice that's such a huge part of 21st century learning. School A, they thought that just because it's digital, they were doing anything. And, uh, some teachers might have taken their old uh, starting to become yellow worksheets, and they knew that they could uh, launch an app that they can take a picture of this worksheet, turn it into a PDF, email it to their students, and they can have students fill out that PDF on their iPads. And they felt like, wow, I am so 21st century, <laughs> when in fact all they're doing was just substitution down at the very b bottom level of the SAMR model. Now there is a time and a place to turn a document to a PDF and fill it out uh, for ease of use, maybe uh, to get it from point A to point B uh, more easily rather than waiting until the student comes back to school if the student is sick or the, or the teacher. So there is a time and a place to do something that uh, lo low at the le level, but when I speak about that, I speak about when they do that the entire time. So this is where I get to appropriate use. Uh, the image I chose was one of a student feeling for the appropriate moisture in soil. So if you want a student to understand the difference between soil that is too dry, soil that is too moist, and soil that is just right for the planting of, let's say, pumpkin seeds, uh, what app would you download for that? What web resource would you have them go to for that? Or is it just time to put the pads aside and get their hands in the dirt and have them feel and come to that conclusion? Now once they've done that, and hopefully wash their hands, they can then grab their iPads and write about it. They can take a picture of the differences. They can then, once that uh, seed is growing, a QR code can be placed on the planters themselves that lead to uh, more information about pumpkins. So now they're, they have the information with them on their iPads rather than having to pack up, go to the library, and take out uh, the encyclopedia letter P for pumpkin, which, by the way, was taken out by the person who's studying parsley. So see, that's where we uh, leverage the technology for the right reasons. So going back to school B, they discovered how to do uh, new things in new ways rather than uh, doing old things, old ways, with just the new technology. School A, they've seen a change in their electric bill, but not in student engagement. I always like to quote, um, his name will come to me in a second, where he said, uh, David Thornburg, David Thornburg said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you bring all these technologies in and don't provide teachers with a, uh, how to meaningfully use it and, and really make a change, the only thing that's going up in your school is the electric bill. And that was the, the spirit behind that. So in school B, students are authentically engaged. They're empowered. They really uh, have true ownership of their learning, they're sharing with each other, they're not told what to do, but they're told how to think and come across their own uh, conclusions. They're asked wonderful questions such as, how did you come up with that? Or what else? Is there another way to think about that? How did you come across to that conclusion? So, the teachers are handing off the learning to the students so that they can uh, express themselves, again, with the voice and choice, and making the learning uh, realistic and in a very uh, real-world situation. Let's solve problems that really exist uh, today rather than some problems that were written in a textbook uh, 20 years ago. So. Given everything we've covered, which school would you want yours to be? 
<laughs> I would love to see some people maybe even write down in the chat, A or B, which one would you like to be? So in school B, they understood 21st century learning. They knew who to start asking, maybe not the IT guy. Um, fortunately for me, I am the IT guy and the ed tech person. So I'm in a very fortunate position that uh, unless I develop uh, a split personality, I'm not going to disagree with myself. But I know that it is definitely a topic in many schools where the IT people have their job to do, the ed tech people are trying to do some really cool and interesting stuff, and oftentimes those things uh, clash or seemingly clash. So I encourage everyone to make sure that uh, you communicate up top and admins listen carefully and teachers communicate this with your with your admins, uh, there needs to be a very close relationship, uh, and by close I mean a nice weekly meeting between the IT directors and the IT people and the ed tech integrators and, and the people trying to get this done. Because there's nothing more frustrating than trying to uh, go to a certain website or, or leverage a certain tool just to find out at the last minute that it's been blocked by a filter uh, so because maybe your planning happened at home. Uh, and it worked perfectly fine there, but you get uh, to school and then you notice that it's blocked. Uh, and then you have to fill out paperwork that takes three working weeks to get back to you. Maybe that's a bit much, but you know what I'm saying. So that's very important. So School B discovered how to do things in new ways with these new devices, not just these same old, same old uh, with the new technology. PD. I can't begin to tell you how important PD is. And uh, well, I can begin to tell you because that'll, those will be our next set of slides. Uh, our school was very, very fortunate. When we decided to go with one-to-one -one iPads, we also embarked on project-based project learning. And uh, you probably have heard of him before, Tony Vincent. Tony Vincent came to our school and he is basically the godfather, our godfather uh, when it comes to project-based learning and doing so with iPads. So he came with, uh, to, to be with us and it was not a one-time deal. He came in uh, be, during teacher work week. He came several times during that first year. He came back several times during the second year and uh, most of the time for a full week at a time. And uh, that, that made all the difference. Our school is also fortunate enough to have three technology integrators for a school of only 300 students where they get to plan, co-plan, teach, co-teach with the teachers and um, they, they really do provide almost a daily dose of professional development. So um, as much help as you can get, find the smartest uh, uh, ed tech, sorry, the most enthusiastic ed tech people in your school. Uh, to kind of join in and make a little workforce of people that are enthusiastic about it, stay on top of things, and uh, they could be your internal professional development. So let's talk about a few uh, methods of professional development, main, uh, because I know that a lot of you, when you think professional development, you are limited uh, to maybe the professional development that you've had or, and or the, the professional development you're just aware of or would like to go to. So I'm going to go over a few slides here about uh, the different types and uh, I'll let you go ahead and read the pros and cons and I might make some commentary. So of course there's the in-house professional development. Like I said, find your most enthusiastic in-house people who went to a conference or attended a Classroom 2.0 live session and uh, wanted to share what they learned. Bring them in and, and prepare those things. Of course, some of the cons or when I wrote there, led by peers, it's kind of like anybody who's a parent knows that uh, our, our children listening to us is oftentimes not quite the same as hearing the very same information from someone from the outside. So that's why um, I wrote that. Uh, not that it's always a con, it could be a con, especially if it's always Mr. So-and-so uh, who thinks he knows so much. And again, that really depends on the atmosphere of that school. Uh, the pros, of course, uh, it's the least expensive thing because you're not paying anybody anything extra and you can do it as often as you want. I write differentiation because you know your teachers and the person leading the PD would know how to group them uh, more appropriately. So um, there's that and I'll, I'll let you uh, go back and read through those. Oh, look at that, it's Wes Fryer, what do you know? 
what a wonderful source of uh, professional development when you can bring in these professionals, these professional clinicians or workshop and sessions and uh, to your school. Like I said, Tony Vincent kicked us off. Wes Fryer will be at our school, um, but during our event that we're having in November, which I'll speak to a little bit later, which is sponsored uh, by EdTech Teacher. Uh, and we have several EdTech teachers coming uh, to join us. I believe it's five, maybe even six of them coming to lead uh, featured speed, uh, presentations at Miami Device. So of course the uh, pros are is you've got your outsiders, they are experts, and you just don't get any better than, than these guys. Uh, the cons, well, yeah, it is more expensive than having your inside guy who you have to pay nothing to. However, uh, it see, although it might seem a little bit of, ex of an expense, when you divide it uh, within all the different people who are getting the PD uh, and you, you take a look at that number, you notice that truly it really isn't. Um, it might be more expensive than sending one person to a conference, but definitely not more than sending 10. So it is, uh, I think, one that makes a big difference. And uh, the, another reason why I, I wrote expensive uh, is because for it to have its greatest effect, you have to have this quality type of professional development very often. It has to be top quality and it does have to be often. So having Tony come out many, many times, uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to do so, but I'm also aware that um, that may be a challenge to some uh, more so. And by tough to differentiate, well, it could be done ahead of time, of course. You can uh, tell Wes, well, you know, Wes, we're going to uh, separate our teachers into these three groups, and that could be planned ahead. Uh, but of course, uh, let's say Greg comes in and he doesn't know your faculty, it's tough for him to do it unless it's done for him. The next type of uh, professional development is, are your local opportunities. Of course, uh, sessions, workshops, uh, um, learning events and conferences that are happening close to you. Uh, the pros, because they're close by, you don't have to pay so much travel. Uh, you can kind of like go over there, come back. That's what people, let's say, in Fort Lauderdale will do in Miami Device. They'll kind of drive down and go back and, and, it, and it's less of a, of a cost. Um, the cons, well, you never know what you're going to get. Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, and uh, sometimes things come and go and you just don't know what you're going to get. And uh, it may be not exactly what you're looking for in, in your specific uh, category. So it might not be targeted specifically to what you're looking for. Uh, but again, word of mouth goes a long way and I would definitely uh, look ahead and uh, find resources ab about each one of these separate choices. School visits. School visits are great. Find out what school in your area is doing great stuff. And it could be a, a just a, a one day visit if, if it's nice and close. So uh, what's really nice about that, when you visit they usually uh, like to share. So they'll walk you around, they'll answer your very specific questions. So it's, um, and you're seeing it in the real environment. It, this is not, you're just not hearing about it, you're seeing it in action. Yeah, so there's really no way around that. Uh, we at St. Stephen's love to have visitors and we've had visitors from all over the U.S. and uh, as far away as uh, Columbia uh, to come visit and kind of take a look at how our teachers use iPads in the classroom. And uh, it's really important for them to see that because any school with the right amount of uh, funds, of course, can buy iPads, but not any school can use them uh, appropriately. And please, when I say iPads, I, I, am, I do really mean uh, all devices, all technology. Uh, I just use iPads because that's what we have. But uh, when I say that, just go ahead and include Chromebooks and, and such and such. So uh, the cons, well, the leadership might be different. So you might visit that school and you find out that, well, we have this in place because our head of school believes X, Y, Z, and you realize that you come from a school where your head of school believes A, B, C, and uh, there could be that difference. Uh, and again, going to financial situations, uh, maybe that school, maybe you're visiting, uh, 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 let's call it like it is, a, a wealthy school, 
a school where uh, parents might pay $25,000 a year for their elementary school children to go to school, uh, therefore iPads are more easily come by. So that's something also that uh, if I go back to these guys, um, they're very good with. They're very good with working with what you've got. And that's where uh, their expertise comes in. You let Wes or Tony or Craig, uh, Greg or anyone else know, uh, we have one iPad per classroom or one for every two children or one to one. They'll know how to uh, leverage that and uh, get you the most bang for your buck as it were. So of course, I do not need to convince any of you out there about uh, web-based professional development because here you are. Webinars, they're all over. Blogs and videos that people put up. And uh, Wes has been known to blog once or twice a day. <laughs> and he's got some such great, great stuff there um, from his uh, Speed of Creativity website. Uh, the unconferences that happen where basically you get to attend a conference uh, or such, such as virtual conferences online. And I will use the T word here. And that's Twitter. Uh, is there any way to do a, a poll right now? Because I would love, and, and we could just do it in chat. That would be fine. Sure, we can do that. Do, well, do you want to do a poll? I would love to see how many people are currently on Twitter and how many are not. It's just a simple yes or no. Are you on Twitter yet? Yes or no? And okay, green check is yes, red X is no. Over there in the polling tools on the left hand side of your screen. Yes, if you're wow. a Twitter user, no, if you're not. And please do not, do, if you're not, please, I'd love Ooh. to see that red X, that red X light up and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Wow, okay. It seems like that's 100%. So, um, Wonderful. Everyone knows, it seems like everyone knows uh, the, the value of it. But for those who might listen to this later on, uh, does anybody want to, actually, so we can make this a little interactive, uh, does anybody want to, in the chat section, write some of the benefits of Twitter? It's just why are you on Twitter? Why do you stay on Twitter? What have you found on Twitter? And Carolyn here, obviously likes it so much that she's, she has a positive negative, a positive thing, which is her frustration with not having enough time to follow all the interesting links. So to me, that's a positive negative. It's kind of like, boy, I have so much money I don't know what to do with. See, that's a positive negative there. <laughs> so she sees so many wonderful resources that she'd love to follow. She just doesn't have the time. Um, Ah, Melissa must be a, a speaker because she's a little bit held back on the only 140 characters so she can't babble on and on. Again, another positive negative where she just loved to just go on and on uh, like I'm doing uh, <laughs> about all the wonderful things. New tools, articles, and blogs somebody wrote. Wes loves sharing his students' work with others in his PLN. And there's a huge worldwide PLN of connections and access to um, PD and classroom tools, and there's just so much out there. Finding interesting articles of Twitter for being able to connect with so many smart educators and ask questions. Here's where I say um, what I usually say when I talk about Twitter. Ready? Only good teachers tweet. I'll say that again. Only good teachers tweet. Now let me quantify that and let me make myself very clear. That's not to say that if you don't tweet, you're not a good teacher. That's not to say that bad teachers don't, well, that is to say bad teachers don't tweet. <laughs> That's the whole point. Only good teachers tweet. Um, so the reason I mention that is because you're not going to go on Twitter and find a teacher who's disgruntled and just kind of complaining about her job and sending out uh, resources to terrible websites or anything like that. The teachers on Twitter are those who are enthusiastic about what they're doing. They love sharing what they have found, and they really are leveraging the community that happens uh, with other professionals with the same uh, interests. I recently tweeted out, and I'm going to just run over there real quickly and find, oh, here it is. So I found this and I, I tweeted this out and I can tell people like it because it got retweeted many, many times. Quote, 
the most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other. Without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspectives. And that's a quote by Robert John Meehan. So again, it's about the, the camaraderie, the, the, the thrill of seeing what others are doing and stealing ideas which in our profession, thank goodness, is not a bad thing. It's not stealing, it's sharing. It's reusing, it's recycling. And uh, then we make it our own, don't we? And we go up to the top of that SAMR uh, model and make sure that we share it with the world so others can tag off of that, they can give us feedback, and they can um, also make it their own. Okay, so of course there's always conferences. Uh, conferences are, uh, you know, I've gotten so much out of conferences myself. Wes mentioned that he and I have seen each other for the past few years at Mobile Learning Experience, uh, which happens in Arizona. Uh, Podstock happens in Wichita, uh, and that's part of ESDAC. Uh, I, I will hope, I put in for that, so I'll hopefully be attending that. Um, Miami Device is my baby, and I have a couple slides later on about that, so I'll, I'll go a little bit more into that later. Uh, and, and again, these are just some that I picked, and there are so, so many more. iPad Palooza happens in Austin, Texas, and that'll be in mid-June. Uh, Podstock, going back to Podstock, that's in July, I believe mid-July. iPad Palooza is mid-June. FETC is our local uh, state. Educational Technology Conference. Uh, ISTE, of course, is the international one uh, that uh, this year happens in um, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, does anybody, would anybody, oh, Mary, thank you, Mary. Mary said also ed camps. And uh, we know that I believe Todd, Ms. Loney, is at an ed camp right now, and uh, Wes just finished the uh, Oklahoma City ed camp. Is that correct? Um, Patty, good luck with getting to ISTE. <laughs> I hope you get there. And does anybody want to throw out anywhere else that they might be going to? Maker Fair in Kansas City this year, last week of June, instead of ISTE, okay. Phoenix Ed Camp is March 1st. Anybody else like to share? Yeah, this, oh, the Texas one. Yes, of course, the Texas Ed Tech uh, Conference is, is fantastic. I hear I have not been, but one of uh, our featured speakers, and she will be leading one of these Classroom 2.0 Lives, uh, I believe in the next coming weeks, is Erin um, Klein. Erin Klein, Teacher of the Year, as mentioned by McCool, the Michigan, I believe, I might mess this up, Michigan Association of Computer Users and Learning, maybe, M-A-C-U-L, uh, here is a fantastic one, and Erin Klein, Again, uh, one of our speakers from Miami Device, Teacher of the Year for that one. I hear that's fantastic. I, I would like to get to one of those. ASCD, this is this month. And it seems like a few other people are going to Ed Camp Phoenix. So, wow, uh, the chat room here is uh, just exploding. I had the honor to attend the EdTech Teacher iPad Summit in Boston a few months ago. That was fantastic as well as the one that just happened in San Diego. So I encourage you to uh, follow EdTech Teacher, which on Twitter is at EdTechTeacher21. They have tons of summer workshops coming up that are definitely worth paying attention to. So I'm just going to write here their EdTechTeacher21. That's their Twitter handle. Uh, they're in the chat area, so you can copy that and, and look into it. All right, moving on, um, gets to the point where I get to talk about my baby, uh, Miami Device. Uh, Miami Device is uh, sponsored by our school, St. Stephen's Episcopal Day School. It's in Coconut Grove, Florida, which is in Miami, and it happens in uh, on November 6th and 7th. That's a Thursday, Friday. That way, when it's over, you get to spend the rest of Friday and hopefully Saturday and maybe some of Sunday going to the beach in November where it's nice and balmy. And what's better than November on a nice warm beach? I know November on a nice warm beach in Miami 
where Wes Fryer is doing some presentations, along with Tony Vincent, of course, Jeremy McDonald, Holly, and Kevin, and Greg, and Andrew, and Todd, and Sean. And uh, for those of you uh, tuning into Classroom 2.0 Live, I'll let you in on some little secrets. We have more amazing people who have uh, uh, submitted to present, and we haven't made those announcements yet, but I'll let you in on a couple. iPad Sammy will be there. Tech Chef for You, Lisa Johnson will be there. Uh, so we're, it, the quality just keeps going up. David Diamond will be there, and just many, many others that uh, you see all around the ed tech world in Twitter. So again, here are 10 phenomenal presenters and uh, clinicians. And I guarantee that there will be many, many more. Uh, Miami Device uh, will open. Actually, before I talk about that, I would like to share this with everyone because it's important for you to note something. And I'm going to go ahead. And I know you know how to read, but I'd like to read it myself. Miami Device is about learning. Its goal is for students to become authentic, to be authentically engaged as a result of passionate, well-trained educators who want to be masters of their craft. These teachers are willing to explore and embrace best practices for today and tomorrow and understand the importance of student-centered learning. Project, problem, challenge-based learning, 21st century skills, common core standards, classroom flipping, and game-based learning with the support of mobile devices is the curriculum of Miami Device. What I'd like to point out are the words uh, that are highlighted in TEAL. So the, it's about learning. It's about passion, about being engaged. It's about tomorrow. It's about their future. It's about the types of learning. It's about 21st century. It's about uh, what we're talking about today, like classroom flipping, game-based learning. And I'd like to, for you just to notice that the mention of devices or any type of technology did, did not happen to the very, very last part of that sentence, where it said, with the support of mobile devices. So that's the commonality of what will be going on here. But just pay attention to everything that precedes that, which is all about the students, the learning, and about teachers who are passionate about what they get to do. So I hope that you will uh, visit the uh, website and uh, take a look around, see all our uh, read off on our speakers, and see um, all the fun that we're going to have. Because not only will it be an amazing learning experience, but it's also we're really going to leverage what Miami is all about. So you're not going to get a sandwich, a regular ham and cheese sandwich, you might get a media noche. And you're, you're not going to just have uh, uh, just a regular lunch. You might, you're going to have some nice roast lechon pulled pork with black beans and rice. There's going to be Latin music, jazz music, Latin jazz music, Caribbean music happening. We're going to have a closing concert by a great group called Swenelo with us. And it's just going to be, we're going to leverage that. We're, there's also going to be the opportunity to take a culinary, historical, and uh, architectural walking tour of South Beach, where you get to see where Miami Vice was recorded and um, anything else that you watch uh, that takes place in Miami. So it's going to be fun from top to bottom. And I really hope that uh, many of you will be able to join us for that. I think I've gone on uh, quite a bit on that. Now I would love to uh, get some questions about what I've covered so far. OK, Mary, Mary is uh, asking about costs. And Mary, um, uh, it's, on, it's on our website. Uh, there, I, I believe on the first page, there's a little according like, the cost is $3.95 uh, for early bird, which opens March 1st. And that goes through the middle of April. So make sure you get in on the early bird because it does jump up to 575 after that. So um, 395 for for early bird. Uh, the hotel that has been reserved for this conference is literally 20 steps. It's just right across the street. Beautiful hotel called the Sonesta and Coconut Grove. Uh, so it'll be right across. The entire thing happens on our campus. And uh, so you, again, about that, seeing it on, seeing it in the uh, authentic environment, you're going to see uh, Miami Device is going to happen on our school campus, um, in our classrooms, in our hall, and in our uh, very large state-of-the-art computer lab. Peggy did put in a question, Felix. Um, does that cost include the hotel? 
It does not. It's not. No, unfortunately it doesn't. Um, one of the reasons we did it in November was to get that hotel cost as low as possible. And uh, we're talking about a hotel who, that right now, if you took a look and you tried to stay at the hotel now, the regular room would be upwards of $300, $400. Uh, but we got it way under that uh, for about 170 or so uh, mm -hmm. a night. Again, it's not quite a $79 Holiday Inn somewhere, anywhere, but trust me, the the view, the stay, and everything would be well, well, well worth it. it it's, it's quite a beautiful atmosphere. Um, I'll take Wes's question. What have you seen as the most successful strategies your technology integrators, coaches, have used with your teachers to help them embrace project-based learning and the creation of media products by students? The most successful strategies, I think, that our technology integrators have used with our teachers to help them embrace PBL is, well, first of all, leading them, leading them first, uh, coming up with some really good ideas and saying, here, let me show you what we can do with that idea. Like I said, our integration specialists plan with the teachers, so they, it's, it's planning time, and they take a look at the curriculum, they, uh, they say, okay, what are you teaching in your class uh, that's coming up? And maybe they'll say, well, we're doing uh, the Native Americans or Westward Expense, or whatever it may be. Then they go out, they look for great resources, great ideas, and they say, here's what we're going to do. If it's something outside of what the teacher uh, can comprehend, uh, they'll say, well, let me lead this. And these are all teachers. Uh, our immigration specialists are all teachers. So they might start it off. And all it takes, all it takes is for the teachers to see the involvement of the schools, uh, sorry, of, of the students, and they're hooked. Because I've, I've said it before, authentically engaged students inspire teachers. And inspired teachers authentically engage students. So it's very cyclical, and all the um, it, it's, our in, integrators just sets the ball in motion, the snowball in motion. They uh, push forward with it, and the teachers see, wow, the students are really involved in this. They get excited about it, and it keeps going. So of course, where do they get all the wonderful ideas? Well, <laughs> let me use the T word again, Twitter. Twitter, you get the, find the right people to follow, see what others are doing out there that uh, seems to be a neat idea, and custom tailor it to your own needs. So uh, the project-based learning is not something that uh, just happens overnight. It is something that they need to be educated about. Uh, BIE put out a great book about project-based learning, uh, and in our case, in the, in the uh, elementary school uh, level that uh, we gave to all the teachers to read and become familiar with as uh, Tony will tell you, and Andrew Miller, one of our speakers at Miami Device, who's also uh, part of BIE and a guru in uh, project-based learning, will tell you uh, that one of the things that you have to be careful of is the teacher that, who says, oh, I've been doing project-based learning forever. Uh, and really what they mean is project-oriented learning, where the project happens at the end of, of uh, the, the lesson. Uh, to show what you've learned, rather than a project that happens throughout and gets, a, gets assessed throughout. Let me get to another question. Um, I did capture some questions, Felix. I can start sure. towards the beginning. Do you think the PD for teachers may work best by starting with substitution examples and work towards re redefinition? People commented on that in the chat, but I think the person who wrote it wanted your viewpoint on that one. Um, I, I think making them aware of the different levels right from the get-go is, is important. Uh, and of course, letting, letting them know that it is okay to be at the substitution level, uh, just to, to, to get comfortable in the, at the substitution level uh, so that they can then go up to the next one. So I think an awareness of SAMR is very important, uh, and again, baby steps. You know, we did uh, do a lot in a little time. However, we did it with baby steps, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of um, encouragement, and um, again, sure, feel, feel comfortable being at substitution, but know that you've got somewhere to go from there. 
is project is uh, hmm. that went to a link. I, I'll go to another question. How do I convince veteran teachers to embrace more technology in the classroom? And I have some others that I captured. Well, <clears throat> veteran teachers, you know, I I have I have a, something to say about that. Um, I, I would like to. I almost want to rephrase or, or, or rename, because I know exactly what that person means. Mm -hmm. I have seen, quote unquote, veteran teachers. And by veteran, I, I, to me, at least when I, when I hear the word veteran, I hear it's, they've been around for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have seen teachers who have been around for a while absolutely regain an, an incredible enthusiasm for their craft. They were maybe on their way. They were counting down the years to retirement, and all of a sudden, this comes in, and they see, and a light bulb goes off, and and here is a teacher well into her 60s who has just just embraced this and taken off with it. So, so let's let's uh, rephrase the question to how do you deal with reluctant teachers uh, or teachers who just believe that this is a fad or it's just going away? Well. You showcase the teachers who are doing a, a, a good job. You show, showcase all the other teachers who um, are doing it right. You showcase the students that did great things with the teachers who are doing it right. The buzz will happen. And um, I think any administrator, whether they're for this or not, any administrator that sees um, the, the engagement that happens with teachers and students, that positive energy that happens when everybody's involved in something that's just so new and they get to see that they are meeting all the standards and that they are lesson planning and that they're doing their job but that there's just a bigger buzz out there. I think that when you have enough of that, the veteran, the veteran now we call, uh, that now we're calling the uh, reluctant teacher will hopefully uh, see that happening around them. And of course, even if they don't and they're a bit of a scrooge about it and bah humbug, no thanks, not for me, uh, it, it will take a very uh, patient, skillful tech integrator to come in and give small bite-sized pieces for, to try to get this person on board. Um, ultimately, it does fall on the administration, uh, and there was, and I'll let that segue into Patty R's question about administrative support is key. And if the admin is not behind the tech integrator, then you have a harder time. Well, this is true. Um, I, I cannot argue with that. Uh, however, I will say that if the tech integrator's job focuses on the student, students and the teacher, the learning and the teaching process, rather than just the use of and ma making sure that we're using the smart board X amount of hours per day and make sure that we're using it, uh, then, then that's where it's most effective. Because again, nobody's impressed by how many hours uh, or minutes a smart board or uh, Chromebooks or anything else is used. They're, they are, however, they are impressed by some real authentic projects that students are producing getting out there in the community. That's another one. When something really neat happens in your classroom, share it out. Hopefully somebody will hear about it, share it again, and uh, maybe even come across uh, a newspaper or a, a news station that might want to pick up the story and shine a, a nice spotlight on that uh, teacher, which shines a spotlight on the school and what administrator, what good administrator wouldn't like that? Thanks. How do we help, quote, priority schools, unquote, who focus on posted objectives, pacing calendars, gather data, see the value of project-based learning? Oh, boy. Wow, isn't that difficult? Um, you know, project-based learning is, it, it gets everything. It, it gets it accomplished. It gets all the... Uh, it meets all the, uh, what people want where they say, well, this needs to be quantified and, and, and we need to see the results and all that. Um, 
this is a difficult one because a lot of times that comes from a very business-like mentality where, well, we need to see a return on investment. If we're going to go with project-based learning, how is this going to increase such and such? Um, and I will tell you that it, it does take some time and it does take uh, skill, but one can show how uh, the learning is uh, happening, how the uh, standards are being met, and that this is not just a different, fun, quirky, new way of doing things, but rather just one that is more uh, involved, deeper, and 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 it does. It just I, all I can say it really does meet everything that um, the higher ups w want to see. And I have one last question that I captured. And this was partly addressed in the chat by participants. Uh, what about getting this kind of PD in schools that don't have funds? Any ideas? Besides what you shared, any other sure. ideas? Sure. This type of PD in schools that don't have the funds. Well, um, neighboring schools, I think, is one way to go. Um, I think there are many, many um, teachers who are in just passionate, enthusiastic about this. Uh, for you know, I mentioned Tony Vincent. Tony Vincent did not start off doing what he's doing now. He started off in in the classroom, and his enthusiasm led him to uh, maybe help another school or do a presentation here and there, which was uh, maybe as a favor or as just a, his way of sharing what he likes to do. That of course led to more opportunities and more opportunities. So and then eventually led him out of the classroom to do it full time. So what I'm trying to say by that is there are plenty of teachers right now who are doing phenomenal things in the classroom who would lovingly come out and share what they've got out in uh, at their to their neighboring schools for little or no compensation. Um, mm -hmm. So. I really never thought of that before in that way, but now I'm almost thinking about creating some sort of community uh, for such people where they would be willing to uh, provide some professional development um, for, for those types of schools. That's terrific. Those are all the questions that I had. I think we'll go ahead to the closing slide questions now. Okay. I'd like to first uh, give a little shout out to Carolyn Stanley there. She said, I went back at 50, former English teacher as a, com as a computer technology integration specialist. It was a 14 year ride. Loved it. I think they liked me and it was a 14 year thrill ride. That's great. Congrats, uh, congratulations to Carolyn. I'd like to read that. Here's Felix's contact information on this slide. Our upcoming shows on March 1st are Google Forms in the Classroom with Melissa Murphy. On March 8th, donors, the first part of the Donors Choose sessions with Laura Candler and Francie Kugelman. On March 15th, the second part of Donors Choose with Rebecca Burkoff, Jenny Jones, and Paula Noggle. The hashtag fourth chat success stories to Donors Choose. And March 22nd, Erin Klein is going to be the featured teacher. I'll turn the mic over to Peggy for this slide. I just wanted you to know that the Australian e-conference, virtual conference, is going on right now. And it has been fabulous. It started yesterday on US time. So you need to go to that schedule to find out when it is for you. But it continues today and actually into Sunday, depending on your time zone. They have had outstanding keynotes and some really practical, fun, interesting um, presentations. All of them are being recorded. So if you missed any, you can go back and listen to them. But um, it's always great to join them live, too, and be part of that conversation. So go to OzzyLive.com, check out the schedule, and I'd love to see you in some of those sessions. 
And don't forget about the learning revolution. Steve Hargadon has organized so many of these virtual conferences and, and special events all on this one site. So if you sign up for the newsletter on the learning revolution, you'll get one email blast a week that gives you wonderful updates. And it's just such a treasure. So don't forget to sign up for that. Back to you, Lori. Thank you, Peggy. You can nominate a featured teacher on this form that Peggy will post the link in the chat, the tiny URL.com slash CR20 Live Featured Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. You can also nominate yourself if you'd like to do that. When you exit the classroom or exit the show, you'll be taken to the Classroom 2.0 Live Survey. Uh, if you don't or you're watching the recording, uh, the survey link will be in the chat. It's also in the live binder, so there are many places where you can find the uh, tinyurl.com CR20 live survey. Um, those are the three places. When you exit in the chat box or in the live binder. Also, when you fill out that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Please make sure when you put in your uh, email address at the end of the survey that it's a current po potentially personal email address. School email addresses tend to get blocked and you won't get the certificate that way. The archives are available in a video collection and audio collection at um, iTunes U. There's a Classroom 2.0 Live channel there so you can watch the archives in those formats. You can also get an RSS feed of the show archives as well from the Classroom 2.0 Live Weebly page. There are many ways to access the, the archives for the show. And we'd like to extend special thanks to Felix Giacomono uh, as our special guest today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0. Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website and everyone who participated in the show, as well as, of course, the platform of our show, Blackboard Collaborate. Thank you all for coming today, and um, we'll see you next time. Don't forget to log out of the room so the recording will process.